Gone are the days when Hawaii's visitors just soaked up the sun for hours on the beach or golf course. Long before they arrive here, the internet and social media challenge our guests to experience some of Hawaii's most remote, breathtaking, and dangerous places. Too many thrill seekers? Too many of our rescue professionals have paid the price or escaped close calls. Do we want to be known as a dangerous destination? This live broadcast and live stream of Insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff with Hawaii News Now. Last week on Insights, we talked about the growing number of visitors to our islands who are opting to stay in B&Bs and vacation rentals rather than hotels. As tourists venture out on their own, they are also looking to online travel guides for adventures off the beaten path. Unfortunately, these sites do often do too little to warn of the dangers or even the legal risks involved. Instead, hikers trespass on private property to access trailheads. They are lured to isolated areas like the Kalalau Trail on the Nepali coast of Kauai. Honolulu Civil Beat reported that 147 tourists died in Hawaii during the three-year period between 2012 and 2015 while engaging in typical tourist activities like swimming, snorkeling, and hiking. That's nearly an average of one death per week. Tourism officials now play videos at the airport, and car rental companies have put out brochures and pamphlets with safety tips and information about trail closures. But are the tourists even paying attention? Tonight, we'll examine some of the dangers and problems associated specifically with hiking. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbsy.org and our PBSY Facebook page. Now to our guests. Aaron Lowe is the Acting Program Manager for the State of Hawaii Forestry Trail System, also known as Na'ala Hele. A hiker for much of his life and a trail specialist for Oahu, Mr. Lowe now oversees management of the trail system throughout the state. David Jenkins is a 25-year veteran of Honolulu Fire Department. As public information officer, Captain Jenkins is a familiar face, usually on the scene when HFD is involved in any emergency, including hiker accidents and rescues. Kathleen Elliott Pahinui is the information officer for the Honolulu Board of Water Supply. The city and county owned the land under the surrounding Haiku Stairs, also known as the Stairway to Heaven, that's a big issue for her. But through partnerships with a variety of owners, the Board of Water Supply manages thousands of acres of watershed land on Oahu where there are other popular trails. And Susan Dowson is a retired assistant chief for the Honolulu Police Department and current neighborhood board member. She's a resident of Montawili, a neighborhood that has been severely affected by hikers, both local residents and visitors who trespass on private property on their way to and from the Montawili Falls Trail, which was made even more popular through social media. And with that mention of social media, tonight is really a continuation of our Insights program from January 12th of this year. It was the first time we talked about the impact of record-breaking visitor arrivals bringing younger, more adventurous, and thrill-seeking tourists to Hawaii and the power of their preferred form of communication, social media. You know, um, it, just, uh, it just occurred to me that the, the commercials that I see right now is, what's the theme? It's sort of let Hawaii happen. Let Hawaii happen, yeah. Hashtag and, and let it, Hawaii happen. And it's very much about going out someplace new and having something spontaneous happen. Sure. Isn't that part of what drives people out into the hustings, so to speak? You know, some of that is, I, I think, visitors in general. We have a new type of visitor, right? So a visitor is getting on a mobile phone. Uh, they're accessing information via the web, and they're kind of just taking their trip by the horns and saying, hey, I want to experience something, and they're kind of um, going on their own, right? They're not relying on traditional modes of tourism, whether it be guided operations or things like that. That's that's the key point, and I, I want to put in a plug for Sue Kanoho, who mm -hmm, works right, with you guys absolutely. in Kauai. Kauai visitor. Um, she's been helping filter some of the inappropriate, more appropriate ways of marketing, but one of the things Kalani said, I think that really kind of is the 900 pound gorilla in the room and that is conventional methods of marketing the state which we know how to do have brought in you know an increased amount of patronage but it's the social media off off conventional marketing path that is leading people now once they're here into that let Hawaii happen kind of thing and I'm not saying HJ is encouraging it but what is happening is the market is different now where people are craving the new experience that's off the beaten path and we're seeing not only conventional places like our state parks and national parks getting 
full to the hilt, but they're spilling as they look for new areas and part of it is from crowding and part of it is because they just want that, that new image. They want that and we talked about it before, it, it's what I'm calling the narcissification of recreation is people want to go out and capture themselves. Selfie in the, in, lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> and, and once they do that, they post it and what places that only hunters knew about say 20 years ago, like on Oahu, certain areas that were pretty remote. Now they're getting posted. We have visitors from China and Iowa and whatnot hitting, the, hitting those locations, and they don't have the requisite skill sets to go there. Uh, Susan Dawson, let me start with you. You're experiencing this firsthand as a resident of a home near a very popular trail. What's it been like over the years watching the change due apparently to some of this social media? Well, it, it starts off with a trickle of people, and that's great. You know, a few people, nobody needs to manage it. City doesn't need to manage it. State doesn't need to manage it. They, they're pretty well behaved. There's just a few of them. Then we have dozens, and, and we're up to now in Monowilly with hundreds of people every weekend going up to the falls. You know, and, and the falls uh, trail from Kelewina isn't well laid out at all. It's not properly managed. There are no, no infrastructure, there are no restrooms, no, no place to sit down and have a picnic, no place to put your rubbish. Uh, it's just a huge impact on the neighborhood and, and our natural resources. I mean, the, the whole trail is just taking a beating. Let me ask uh, Aaron Lowe from the state DLNR. I mean, rather, we'll talk a little bit more later about Montawilly specifically, but what are you guys observing when it comes to the behavior, not just of visitors, but also of locals? who are venturing out, what's it like out there trying to keep track of all this? Well, what we've seen is that uh, a lot of times I think that tourists are, um, you know, it's a, it's a large number of tourists. But when it comes to locals, it might be a smaller number, but some of the tourists that are locals that we've witnessed, um, some you know, uh, are, can be disrespectful, and that leaves uh, a negative impression, long-lasting impression on the community. And so that's unfortunate, and I think that adds, adds and exacerbates the, the, the issue and the problems. Um, but it's that, that mass, huge load of tourists that are finding, um, finding it on the Internet. I think uh, also uh, we'd be in agreement that, you know, there's quite a few uh, military residents that we have in the islands. Um, that love to go to these places and frequent them um, on their weekends. And, and they're young and adventurous and, and looking for something fun to do. And, and, in, and it's out there and we have it and everyone's having a good time. Unfortunately, it has a real negative effect, um, kind of a backlash on, on these smaller communities that are normally sleepy, nice little communities that have a trailhead. You'd also feeling the pressure as the fire department that has to go out and chase down these people. Are you seeing, uh, Captain Jenkins, that more risky behavior as well as people accessing because they want to get that shot, they want to get that picture, that social media thing? Well, risky behavior just going into those very hazardous uh, areas is, is definitely one of our concerns. Uh, some of the more hazardous trails like Crouching Lion or uh, Olamana Third Peak, Poly Notches, those are the ones that we really are concerned about because they've had fatalities in the recent years. And that's sometimes people who have seen the picture and they want to replicate that experience? I couldn't really say if uh, what their personal motivations are. We, we could hazard a guess, but just those locations themselves, we would rather people refrain from going to those spots. You know, Kathleen Payanui from the uh, Board of Water Supply, what's your uh, theory about what's going on in terms of the social media impact on where people are going? Uh, I think social media has absolutely fueled the quest for something new and different and I think as Kurt mentioned in the clip we just saw about the narcissistic I have to get that selfie at the top um, of haiku stairs I mean you, you everyone will probably remember a couple years ago they had a swing up there and the videos the YouTube videos and stuff and it was for us, it was horrifying uh, that that was up there. And we had to spend over $20,000 to go up there and take this down that somebody had just put up. And that's money out of our ratepayers' pocket. And it's, it's time away from our mission uh, of serving the public with safe water. And uh, the internet has really, we track it every day. We get a report every day. And I will come back, especially on, after a mon on a Monday, and there will be three dozen tweets and Facebook posts about I'm going to do Stairway to Heaven, I'm going to do, and from all over the world, Nor Norway, we just had some from Norway recently, Australia. So social media has absolutely fueled 
the quest, the desire for a unique experience that most people, I think, don't realize uh, is probably well beyond most of their capabilities. Yeah, we've got some, uh, some data here. Uh, this first data is from the fire department about the mountain rescue. So we're only talking about Oahu. This is Honolulu Fire Department. So in 2015, 187 rescues. 2016, 260 rescues. I don't want to do the math too fast, but that's like 73 more rescues, right? And then in 2017, only up through the first half of the year, not quite, 166. Mm -hmm. So you're on a pace to hit over 300 rescues in the mountains. Um, we mentioned the haiku stairs specifically, 18, 22, and 7 also yeah. seems to be trending up. What kind of a burden does that put on, on the department? Well, there is a uh, definite burden. <clears throat> Uh, as far as financial, it, it's all within our budget. However, the risk uh, to our personnel and equipment, uh, but the most important one is, uh, you know, we can't be at two places at the same time. So when where uh, personnel and equipment is doing a rescue somewhere, especially because of somebody putting themselves in harm's way unnecessarily or not preparing for their hike, mm -hmm. uh, if our uh, equipment is up there, you know, rescue personnel, helicopters up there, they're not available for other rescues that might be uh, even more time sensitive, say ocean related rescues. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, go through some more um, data. This time on fatalities, we'll talk about the number of people who have actually died in these accidents. And this is statewide <coughs> numbers, primarily from uh, the health department, medical examiners, and so on. So in Hawaii County, five fatalities over three to four years. Honolulu, 10 fatalities, Kauai County, 5, Maui County, 8. About one-third of those are non-residents, which is a larger proportion than tourists actually make up in the population. And then the non-fatal injuries, if we can go through those, um, 180 discharged from emergency units, 77 required admission to the hospital by county, Hawaii County, 56, Honolulu, 105, Kauai County, 32, Maui County, 64. Again, about a third non-residents. 25% of those requiring hospitalization were non-residents. Um, you know, what is happening? What, how, what is the most, what, what, how do people usually die in these accidents? What happens, Kevin? Is oh, it simply boy. falling off the edge of a cliff or is it? There's, there's, a, there's a whole myriad ways of getting in trouble. There's, there's of course, the, the traumatic of, of falling, uh, uh, trip and falls uh, and, and traumatic injuries. Uh, but there's other things in terms of uh, uh, unpreparedness, yeah. uh, not being hydrated before, during, and, and after. Uh, there's uh, just not even uh, being well uh, um, uh, briefed, finding out what the trail is and what the, the hazards of that trail and what skill sets you need to, mm -hmm. to traverse those trails safely. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of things, but the ones definitely that pop up in a high profile are the ones with the falls but a large majority is just people running out of daylight. They start late. Um, Aaron Lowe from the, the state, what, what's your observation in terms of the kind of injuries you tend to see? And, and what do you do as, a, as an organization that's trying to maintain trails to try and keep them safe? I mean, can you really keep trails safe or is that just <laughs> you're battling nature well, all the time? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's what our job is, is to try <coughs> and provide trails for people to be safe on. So. The trails that we maintain and manage, uh, we try to direct the public to as much as possible through our website, through our uh, brochures, uh, any type of um, media that, that we can. And we're trying to step that up to be able to compete with the ongoing you know, uh, increase in social media or, or what I like to go, call as social trail media. In our world, we call uh, trails that go off the main trail a social trail. So I've come up with the term, you know, social trail media is basically going off of that path that you're supposed to stay on. And that's what happens a lot with social media is there's a lot of misinformation out there. So we try to direct people to what we are managing and that includes our, we have a new website and that website has uh, the most amount of content and information that you can get uh, more than any other website because uh, we've hired people to give us that content and make it interesting so that we draw people in um, but it's still hard some other sites and are uh, a little are very creative and very open and and again like 
you know, I think what Kurt was saying too is that there's, it's those places off the trail, off of what we manage that's actually intriguing, you know, and. Well, why would they be more intrigued by that when they've got a perfectly more safe, they've got a map and everything else? Is it just because of the pictures out there of these places or is there specific instructions about how to violate the law and get to these trails? Um, you know, it, it's hard to say, but, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, people are looking for something different. I don't want to be, you know, a lot of people don't want to be told where to go or have to follow a sign. And, and, and sometimes word of mouth is very, uh, very powerful, too. And, oh, we wouldn't believe how, what this waterfall looked like I went to the other day. Guaranteed someone's going to try and go to that waterfall. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, um, years ago when I got here, 30 years ago, we didn't really have the trail program at that point and I went and hiked by word of mouth and those are places that now are you know back then yeah, yeah. Or, or 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 have up to 150 people a day on them back then it was like I was the only guy and it was it was fantastic yeah. Susan Dossett um, when you see the people that are traversing your neighborhood in our discussion a little bit about it uh, and we'll talk more specifically about it later but there's all these different ways people can access these trails do you see them like with their phones going, okay, we're supposed to walk through this guy's house <laughs> where we're supposed to, you know, is it, is it that obvious that they're being Pretty much. They'll be that? standing on the corner going, no, we're supposed to go this way. And, and I'll even tell them, no, that's illegal. It's trespassing, that's somebody's property. No, but this is the way that they said we're supposed to go and we're gonna go that way. Like who's they, right? You know, and, yeah. and you're like, shock that they would do this you know when you actually point them in the right direction to the actual legitimate trailhead and they stubbornly refuse to do it I've, I've actually seen uh, write-ups on blogs where you know take a left at the no trespassing sign <laughs> I mean, using the no trespassing sign as a direction finder oh yeah so. yeah definitely I mean there's so many ways to get to haiku stairs that it's impossible to count yeah. and in fact I think one day when you guys were out uh, doing some very important work you had to swing by and get a couple people out of a culvert or something just recently it was the same day as another uh, issue it's had happened several weeks ago several weeks in the ago of an emergency exactly they diverted from rescuing one group right to addressing another group that was looking for haiku stairs they got lost looking for the trailhead correct trying to find a way of circumventing correct. all the barriers security, yeah. right and around our security guard there so that's a perfect example of what the captain was talking about earlier we could go a little bit more into haiku stairs now you know it was closed to the the public in 1987 as I understand due to vandalism and liability the US Coast Guard owns the facilities around it but the city and county owns the land right the Board of Water Supply. I don't think the Coast Guard has any uh, ownership anymore and it was 1989 I'm sorry uh, that it was closed to the public finally uh, but then it got renovated in 2005, so people got a little bit confused. So it got made safer, even though it was still not supposed to be legal, right? Well, uh, the Harris administration at the time did some uh, did some renovation of the stairs, upgraded them, uh, fixed them, and then I, I don't I'm not 100% clear on all the details, but something happened where it was supposed to be transferred over to the city and county, and for whatever reason, at the time, the city council did not approve the transfer. And then the um you folks just want to remove the stairs if, if it's stuck with your if you're stuck with managing it you'd rather they just not be there yes we have a uh, environmental impact statement out right now that we're doing a, a study and uh, the preferred action right now course of action is removal of the stairs but we are looking at managed access and transfer and all those things as well specifically to the haiku stairs uh, captain what kind of challenges does that trail specifically pose for hikers and what I mean, I've seen that, that area where it's completely in the clouds. You couldn't do much about that even if you got a call. There's been many a times, whether it's by weather, dark, uh, and, uh, um, you know, high winds, where we have to suspend operations and uh, hikers have to spend, you know, several extra hours or spend the night up there. Uh, fortunately, in, in for my memory, I don't, I don't recall any life and death where there was a, a, a life-threatening injury or illness where they needed immediate uh, uh, care. It, basically, they spent an uncomfortable night up there, but the potential of being uh, gravely injured and awaiting rescue because of that remote location hazardous for us to get there, it, it's, it's, it's a very dangerous way. 
it's not just the haiku stairs. It's actually the summit area where people are finding other ways of getting there uh, through Moana, Moana Lua Valley and other areas uh, on the peripheral sides trying to get there. And those areas can be even more hazardous than the stairs themselves. So it's not just the stairs, it's, it's the general areas and a type of rock and trail where it's crumbly and hazardous. People just don't know the hazards until they get themselves way up in there where their lives are in jeopardy. You know, interesting uh, caller, uh, born and raised here but traveled extensively, wants to know why the state cannot have a tram or a cable to take people up to these dangerous areas. They can block up the trails but allow visitors and residents to safely enjoy <coughs> the beauty. Interesting idea. What do you think? Well, I think that, uh, you know, those ideas have been discussed in the past by different administrations. Cable and that, car to the top of Cocoa Head was one that I remember. <laughs> right. Um, not sure how the neighborhood community boards would react <laughs> to that. Uh, I think, you know, our an outdoor circle, uh, our views of yeah. these beautiful landscapes are wonderful, and that type of feature would, would obscure that. It's an interesting idea, and other countries definitely have engaged in that, that those types of facilities, but... Yeah. You know, Susan sure. though, on that point, I mean, your problem, your problem in your guys' neighborhood is that no one has really ever invested anything in providing for all these people. Absolutely. It's not managed by anyone at this point. It's not the state, not the city, not private property owners, no one. Um, and they go off trail a lot. That's how they get lost. Mm. And, and like you mentioned earlier, many of these people, they're not... Uh, professional hikers you know they're not prepared hikers they go in at six o'clock at night you know and you'll even I'll even stop my car and say it's too late to go you'll never make it back <laughs> and they'll tell me they can make it back you know and then in three hours these guys will be going to get them out you know <laughs> let, me, let me ask uh, all of you folks uh, bring us up to we'll bring you up to speed a little bit on the situation with Mona Willie now that we talked about the multiple owners so the Royal Hawaiian Golf Cl Club as I understand it owns a chunk of the property through which the trail goes then there's there's some um, roads that were the the Royal Hawaiian Golf Club clubs roads that you say now they don't let people park on which has forced people into your neighborhood right that's mostly for the Olamana trail that Correct. they use that um, would you like to well, yeah, I mean... Is you've got a trail there too in that same area? No. No, um, what we we have um, the Monowilly Falls Trail that we have under our jurisdiction is further on up. The Mo Monowilly Falls Trail that's known... Yeah, the that connector trail, right? Right. The connector. So you come in from the hairpin turn, hike in on our Monowilly demonstration trail, and then drop down that's to the waterfall. That's a really hard trail, though. That's a little bit more challenging. <laughs> um, and, and the alignment that's in place now um, it goes through uh, HRT land. and so that's the golf club. Right. And right. so that, you know, and that, that was something that is a provision from the original uh, conditional use permit uh, some 20 years ago that the community wanted to see that landowner who was coming in with golf courses to provide an access. Now, there was nothing in that permit that um, stipulated what type of maintenance right. or management exactly. of the access. So they're upholding what they need to do for that access by not preventing people from going on there but um, at the same time there's no management in place for uh, for the trail. Let me ask, right. even though I'm not, uh, not specifically um, <coughs> asking you uh, Kathleen Payanui about uh, Mauna Willie but as a as a responsible landowner um, what's the balance that you you see? I mean you folks, your mission is to collect clean water and make sure it's available Deliver to safe, all of us. safe, dependable, and affordable water <laughs> so is our mission. your mission is not to operate a recreational <laughs> no, trail. No, it is not. But you can't get anybody else to take it off your hands. Well, uh, part of the EIS process is going to delve into that. We actually do have some people who are, who have proposed, who have some proposals. Um, so that's part of what we're going to do is look at that process through through the impact study. So. Okay, and Susan, yeah. you wanted to say some more. About yeah, no, it's just the and the current <coughs> parking for the Kelewina access, which is what the um, the private landowner HRT, I guess the the Royal Hawaiian, they uh, have that access. So people park on Kelewina Street, and I mean cars line the road and it goes on the weekends. It's horrible. Mm -hmm and throwing their rubbish and making a mess. And, and that's what the residents want to have stopped. Yeah. 
there's no peace in their neighborhood anymore. And, and closing that trailhead access will, will help solve that issue for the neighborhood because there are three other access points to Monowili Falls. And we're also, uh, right now, we're looking at maybe getting the Queens retreat as another access, which is closer, you know, than the other access points. So it, it would be a shorter hike. Parking would be away from the neighborhoods. There would be sufficient uh, restroom facilities, which there's nothing at all now, and a place for people to dispose of their rubbish instead of on the side of the trail. You know, this brings up, just in general terms, something that a couple of uh, viewers are asking about, you know, question, why don't we make tourists pay for the rescue services and or the services of the, that would be necessary to service them in general, parking and mm -hmm. all those sorts of things. But let me start with you, uh, Captain. Uh, why don't we make tourists pay for the rescue services? I guess we would have to make everybody pay for the rescue services, right? So uh, if somebody's in need of rescue, uh, they'll get a fee, a search and rescue fee. Is that that's what you're? Yeah, yeah. another caller asked the same thing. What are the issues <coughs> in charging for rescues? Some other jurisdictions charge, for example, Oregon. Well, Honolulu Fire Department, we do not support that. Uh, in alignment with uh, uh, Coast Guard, I believe they have a similar uh, belief as well. What we feel is if, if someone in need of rescue feels that they may get a large bill for their rescue, they may delay their call for help or even refuse mm -hmm. a call for help until it's too late. So I, I try and illustrate this with a scenario, say I'm hiking with my family and I'm starting to feel a little shortness in breath and a little bit under the weather and maybe something's wrong and I'll try and tough it out. I don't want to have to pay five, ten thousand dollars for for the rescue, but I feel there might be a, a big fee. So I'll try and tough it out for a few more hours. So with that coming with the oncoming of, of nightfall, Prob uh, possible uh, onset of uh, deteriorating weather conditions or even a deteriorating medical condition, all three of those things can compound a rescue mission, making it more complex and dangerous for both the patients and the rescue personnel. You know, on that point though, and one of the other callers is asking, well, maybe if you charged for rescues where they were not even supposed to be there as opposed to someone who's on a legal trail and so on. I mean, it, would that be a disincentive? Oh, there's someone else bite on that. I know you guys don't really want to <laughs> go there too much, but what about that idea? What do you guys think? That would it be a good idea if you're at a place you're not allowed to be and we have to rescue you, you're going to pay a bill. Hmm. You have a lot We're, of people <laughs> like that. <You> <laughs> we, we still feel regardless of where the location is, whether they're in Diamond Head or whether at the top of Haiku Stairs, if there's a delay at top of Haiku Stairs, we're still gonna be in jeopardy going there. So we want an early activation of, you know, call for help. So there has been times where we, we have taken the uh, patients to uh, landing zones and if there was a, a trespassing, we have notified DLNR and have notified police to, to continue with the investigation and there, has been a few um, uh, violations and where there's been s citations. However, we do not want people to delay. So anything that would add to a delay for a call, we're, we don't support that. Okay, let me move on to some of these other questions because it's going into this issue, uh, you know, um, about financing. Clearly, I mean, does anybody think there's enough resource available to government to actually maintain, protect, handle this issue of to the tourist numbers we have? What do you think? Well, it's hard, it's hard to say. Um, you know, I, I don't know exactly where, you know, the, the money could come from specifically. I think that there's some potential. When you look at other states, they depend heavily on their, on their tourism authority. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and in other states, what I've seen is actually a real push and, and marketing campaigns to get more people to come to their uh, towns because they just, they don't have tourism and they're changing their economic uh, models. Uh, with us, we, we we definitely have a beautiful place and we need to maintain that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I look at it as kind of, you know, maybe in marketing terms, it would be, you know, product enhancement uh, could be another word given to resource <coughs> management. Uh, in other words, you know, put money back into what your 
trying to bring people to, and that and so I think that you know it's part of any marketing is to put money back into your product. Yep, I agree I completely, agree. Yes. and I think even the fiscal year 2018 <coughs> budget. You only get 1% of the whole budget, DLNR. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's our natural resources gets 1%. And that's not even kind of, okay, let's take away the salaries, let's take away buildings, equipment, leases, and all that. You're probably left with not much to yeah. manage your oh, trips. Oh, no, I know. I, I'll you give know? a plug for my state senator, <laughs> Senator Guy Riviere, but I know he's worked very, he has worked very hard for DLNR. I know he and Kurt have worked very closely together to get uh, DLNR more money. As a, speaking as a resident of the North Shore, um, we do not spend enough on our natural resources, and I, I personally believe we are reaching our carrying capacity, and we absolutely need to start thinking about managing it because we're going to kill what we have. And unfortunately, having also worked in the tourism industry for many, many years, I feel sometimes we had blinders on where we were looking too much about making sure we're bringing people here, but then not looking at how we're managing our resources for longevity and and not just for the tourists but what about the residents exactly we forget, why we live here we get lost in the mix and I tell you on a weekend on the North Shore and I'm sure it's the same in Kailua you're like I don't feel like I even live <laughs> in a nice little community anymore and it's getting to the point where people are starting to feel very um, Angst, a lot of angst. There's a lot of negative energy starting to bubble up. I'm afraid. Let me ask you though, uh, Kathleen Pahini, on the on the issue. We talk about haiku stairs. One example that we've seen where revenue comes in to maintain and support a, a project is on Diamond Head. Now, that's not mm -hmm. one of your trails, but it's a state trail, and they bring in a considerable amount of money, as I understand. Hanama Bay is another example, considerable amount of money. If you had a revenue stream for haiku stairs. Would it be manageable so you, to the point where you could have a viable, cool attraction for people if you had someone paying for it? Is it a matter of money? No, um, I think it's just it, for border water supply. It's just not within our mission. We really want to focus on our core mission, which is delivering clean, quality water to the people of Oahu. Um, so for us, it just does not fit tidily into our, our core mission at all. Um, okay, some more resource questions. Getting quite a number of questions. I want to kind of get to them. Um, as the number of hikers has grown, has there been any growth in the number of maintained trails, maintained and legal trails? Uh, Aaron Lowe, I mean, have you been able to expand the network? Yeah, expansion is uh, challenging. Um, you know, the thing with Hawaii is, is that uh, we have a li limited amount of land base. It's a lot of elevation. Uh, we're bordered by um, water, cliffs, and not too much in between. So um, we try to expand where we can. There's a lot of different trails that are out there that we know of, um, and and they fall on either private land or military land, and it's part of our mission to try and expand where we can. And um, to your point, I mean, it, in our program, I mean, it would, we would advocate for trying to find some kind of solution for the stairs, uh, but the amount of um, money that would be needed to jump start that for facilities, uh, let's say at the, you know, bathrooms and parking and all of that, if that could be in place and then find a third party concession uh, to manage it and sustain it would be fantastic. And I think that it would be, you know, great for our economy also. But but it's just, it, it's extremely challenging to find that huge pot of money to just jumpstart and start that. You know, Sue Dawson, you, mentioned, we, you and Kathleen both talked about the quality of life in these places where you've lived and you, you were attracted to. Um, how bad is the quality of life due to the situation for your neighborhood right now? And, and what would you see as an appropriate solution short of closing the trail? Wow, I think that's the only thing they've said will help is closing it because it is there is no place to park and it's not managed by anyone. Uh, the trail isn't managed and there is no place to park. I, I, I don't see an answer. The only thing would be to move the immediate location, you know, uh, off to probably Queen's Retreat where, you know, it is more managed. Exactly like you were talking about for Haiku Stairs where you have a parking lot and, and maybe charge a fee for the parking lot, you mm. know, and, and have somebody manage it. and. You know, I mean, they do it in other countries, you know, where it's properly managed and properly taken care of. I, I don't see it as 
doable at all the way it is. Was it, wasn't it, was it a trail supposed to be closed temporarily while they tried to find a solution? Uh, I believe the city gave the property owner the option to close it while they worked on a solution, oh, but they option. have not. Okay. They have not. Um, a good question for the viewer along the lines of what we were talking about. Has Hawaii considered limiting the number of visitors on any island at any time? I, I think that back in the Ariyoshi administration there was some consideration of that, but no. it's pretty much gone by the wayside in the meantime. You know, um, this issue of private property, though, you know, um, <coughs> when I was active in, in some hiking and scouting and so on, it felt like we kept going to the same places over and over and over. There weren't enough choices for us as a, as a scout troop, you know, and but I know that there's huge sections of the, of the island that are closed off because they're private property, but look like a really nice hike. Um, do people have a right to access trails that are private property or is that entirely up to the private property owner? Yeah, it, it depends on the situation. Um, well, you know, if it is uh, a lot of times what we're trying, well, what we're trying to do is expand on areas that we know that we can provide more uh, trail access and more areas for recreation. Um, but when it comes to private landowners, yeah, it, if there's a trail on their land, um, then it's up to that private landowner to enforce it or, or manage it. Um, and uh, a lot of times that, that comes down to, you know, posting uh, no trespassing signs and uh, working with enforcement on, having, on doing that. But in terms of um uh, the, the role of a private property owner, if they just let people go and don't enforce it, do they lose their ability to defend their property? Um, no, I mean, that, I, I've never seen that, that happen. Um, a lot of times what happens is it goes by the wayside, they don't recognize it until it becomes a problem. The community brings it to their attention. Um, I think Mariner's Ridge would be a good example of that. Eventually the, the community was, was upset with it and uh, I think that they might have had some form of an injury on the trail and at that point they felt that you know it was too much and, and they closed it. You know, uh, Kathleen Pagadui, uh, the Board of Water Supply, we, we discussed this prior to the show about um, how difficult it is to prevent people, even if you say we're closing the trail, <laughs> even if you say you're closing the trail. Um, tell us about what your experience has been using private security at a trailhead to prevent people from using that trail. What happens? Well, uh, the, first of all, what people don't realize is that the parcel that Haiku Stairs sits on is landlocked. There's no easements. I mean, we have special easements with uh, adjoining landowners to allow our staff to go on, but only for Board of Water Supply employees. And so you actually are traversing, depending on which route you come, you could be trespassing over about six different landowners. Um, so we do have a security guard at the trailhead uh, who tries to discourage people from going up. Obviously, we're not going to get into a physical confrontation with them, but what they'll do then is they'll call the police and say somebody is going up there, come back. Uh, if you can come at such and such a time, I expect they'll be coming down. And it does happen, and the police will be waiting for them down there, and they give them a citation. But it's I mean, very but difficult. But you have to get a police officer there when the person comes down. Exactly. How so, many times have people been cited? Well, this year uh, we've cited so far through June of this year 18 people. We actually have, uh, we just received a couple of subpoenas to go to the district court in Kaneohe on, on a couple of those citations. But for example, in uh, 2016 alone, we issued 325 citations. You know, I'm getting a number of questions just about that issue of enforcement. I believe several hiking places should be prohibited, especially in Hana Maui. Uh, why doesn't DLNR have more enforcement of the illegal hikes? I see 20 to 30 hikers a day going to Sacred Falls. Can the panel address limiting the number of visitors on hikes on Kauai there, like they're doing on Haleakala? Uh, let me ask you, Aaron, Aaron Lowe, who's supposed to be enforcing this? I mean, on your, your trails, you, your job is to open trails. Another division of DLNR is to prevent misuse of property, but do you, don't care people actually enforce who's supposed to be on private trails or anything like that? Um, no, not unless they have some kind of an agreement with the private landowner. But when it comes to our trails, 
um, yeah, we're in a situation where we might have to start regulating the number of people on trails or charging fees. And uh, we do need the enforcement arm to help us with that effort. And um, I'm, I'm feeling encouraged with our new leadership. Um, Cap uh, uh, Chief Farrell is our new DLNR administrator for DOCARE, and I'm um, hopeful that we're going to you know, start seeing some uh, more enforcement efforts. We are already, I think, Kalalau and, and some other areas, Diamond Head, um, has seen a great increase in, in enforcement. And I think that's kind of key, and that's what we see in other states also, is that uh, you, you need that to support your management efforts. Mm -hmm. we, you, you mentioned Kalalao. Let's, let's talk to, about Kalalao a little bit, because that's a place where, as uh, you know, the things just have gotten completely out of control. Um, we mentioned it before, but few dispute how dangerous that trail really can be. You know, there's all these different websites talking about Kalalao, you know, even a place where people have fallen off the mountain and died. You know, while one hiker website we looked at calls Kalalao one of the most dangerous trails on earth, recommending anyone who tries it to be very experienced and in excellent physical condition, another website we found called unrealhawaii.com mm. presented a different viewpoint of their group's experience hiking at Kalalao. Conveniently for these hikers, they had picture perfect weather. They were not at all anxious about the stretch of trail that measures less than 16 inches wide with a drop of 2,000 feet. And we have their photos from that stretch of the trail. This is how they described it. This is one of the coolest sections of the Kalalau Trail. You're walking on a narrow trail on a cliffside made of loose dirt. You can see there's plenty of room to walk. Compared to the hikes we've done on Oahu, the Kalalau Trail felt very safe. For less experienced hikers, though, I could see how this section could be a little unsettling. Now we wonder if this is a good example of the kind of misleading information that is found online. Is that, you know, you, you're, you're driven by whatever site you pick. That's correct. And, and you know, what, again, what we're trying to do is point people to our website. Uh, Kalalau Trail is a state park trail. Uh, it's a slightly, it's a different division than us. Um, they definitely ch have the same challenge as we do. Uh, just trying to point people to the correct information. And, um, you know, I would hope that someone would read that and understand that, you know, not hope that they would read that and use that, that information, one, right, that particular right. one, right. Yeah. But uh, that they would they would recognize that there is definitely uh, a danger in, in going on that trail. And, and that trail has uh, permitting um, involved in getting and going on that trail. And I think that the, um, the enforcement has been stepped up on that. And, and uh, so hopefully, you know, people who know go before getting hurt. You know, uh, on that point, we do have another clip that I'd like to toss us to, and that's about uh, a recent enforcement effort that was done there where they went and they got something like 200 people arrested in Kalalau in the last few years. And um, when DLNR made a recent trip there, they ended up finding a lot of people suspected to be long-term squatters. We've got a clip from the chief of the Dokar division, I think it's there, uh, Robert Farrell, and uh, here's what he said about his disappointment with, to see the special area being abused. Uh, so yesterday we came in early in the morning and uh, hiked along the legal camping areas and checked a few folks. Most of the people had permits. We did notice that there were a few campsites that looked like they had been there for quite a while and uh, so nobody was there. We hiked up the canyon outside the legal camping area and we came on several individuals who were in illegal camps uh, that had been there for quite a long time. A lot of infrastructure, a lot of stuff that was packed in, some environmental damage. Uh, there was an illegal crossbow uh, in one of the camps, so they may have been poaching uh, the local wildlife, goats, pigs. Uh, we found uh, some small uh, marijuana starter plants, and then we found uh, larger marijuana actually budding plants. And so there were several subjects in the area. They had no permits, uh, in addition to being inside the illegal camping area. And uh, it just was a, not something we like to see back here. Just something very, uh, 
very detrimental to the environment. The thing about this place is it's very, very remote, logistically challenging to both put officers in here, keep officers in here in any kind of sustained effort. So we're really just back here trying to spot check uh, when we can. And uh, so it's a, it's a very difficult, logistically challenging place to enforce. There's no communications. Uh, satellite phones are the only way to establish contact with anybody uh, for emergency services or any type of uh, uh, law enforcement uh, actions that we need to take. And then once we uh, have people back here, getting them out of the area safely is a big challenge. So uh, it's a very challenging environment to work in. Captain Jenkins, uh, that must be making you think, well, that's kind of our job, too, <laughs> go, getting on these very remote areas. How big a challenge is that? I know we lost a couple of firefighters uh, a number of years ago in a, in a rescue. I, th I think it was a rescue, right? Um, what, what is it that you know concerns you most about this future that we're talking about in terms of keeping people safe, trying to rescue people in, in these incredibly remote areas? Well, with Oahu, our, our, our remote areas is right along the, um, the Kotlau Ridge line, where we have that um, possibility of uh, uh, load cloud cover, uh, uh, different uh, types of wind conditions, hazardous, uh, and this is with the helicopter operations, and, and I believe you were referring to back in 95 where we had mm. that uh, uh, helicopter uh, crash with our uh, pilot, uh, uh, Peter Crown, and, and also uh, two uh, um, police officers as well. Oh, police officers. So uh, um, that, that was a, definitely a tragedy where we were looking for a lost hiker. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we were unable to locate that hiker as well. Uh, so uh, you have more occurrences where uh, firefighters and uh, uh, other responders putting themselves in jeopardy uh, on behalf of, of people who unnecessarily put themselves in jeopardy without preparing, uh, without uh, looking at what's the safer areas to go to, the thrill seekers, uh, it, it's it's a very difficult situation to try and uh, mitigate. But the best way we can look at it right now is through education and preparedness for for these people as they're coming in, whether it's local or whether it's military or visitors, getting the education out to them as much as possible. There's going to be the thrill seekers that we just not going to be able to convince, and that's going to be enforcement and other means, but for the bulk of it, if we can get the majority of people well educated on what's the safe way of enjoying our, our islands, it would be best for all of us, including the residents and emergency responders. You know, um, uh, Aaron Lowe from DLNR, again, that's not your division that went down in there to Kalalau, but it make you, must make you think, of what, what kind of resources would you really need to bring up the safety level of some of these areas? Well, I think, you know, for our trails, um, our Nala Heli trails, we're the only trail program in the state. So we exclusively and extensively spend, uh, you know, our federal recreation trail money on the improvement of trails uh, for safety purposes and, and for the enjoyment of the public. So, um, you know, it, it takes, we'd like to expand. We'd like to open up more trails and give more opportunities out there. Um, but uh, we do have the challenge of trying to uh, negotiate uh, some of these trail accesses with private landowners. Uh, military, there's quite a bit of military training land that could be have opportunities for um, expansion. Uh, we have expanded some of our forest reserves on Oahu, uh, Honoluliuli, um, with the help of the Trust for Public Lands in partnership with uh, other agencies like Board of Water Supply and also the military. Um, also, Moanalua Valley was a uh, acquisition that, that uh, came into our hands, and now we have more trails in, the, in those areas. But um, it, it's continued uh, challenge. We have a pretty minimal staff, um, and we'd like to, you know, I think, uh, be able to grow our staff and be confident that we're able to manage any new uh, places that we open up uh, for the public so, and, and be ready. Uh, for the increase of the use. You know, as Susan Dustin, I mentioned, you're thinking, God, it feels like everybody's coming to my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder if you're thinking that, I, you know, is there a way that we could get more people to go to more places instead of all coming to Monowilly? Uh You know, it's, it's a beautiful falls, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, it's not maintained, the, the trailhead that they're using now. And I think if we stewardship the area in the proper way, 
it can be available for enjoyment for all. You know, and, and also the education, they need to be properly suited to go hiking. I mean, I've had people knock on my door, can I have some water before I go hiking? I'm like, jeez, <laughs> you would think you'd at least know to bring a water bottle, you know? But, but no, I'm serious, no. So uh, proper preparedness, a better location, a better trail to access the natural resource is all necessary if you really want it to grow and to be protected. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, this is an interesting question because when we start talking about how to enforce and how to finance these kinds of things, you naturally bring up the question, well, if we start to restrict access, then we're, ch we're actually going after culturally significant uh, rights in that Native Hawaiians, you know, um, these are areas that there is some, I think, uh, right to access certain places. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathleen, I don't know how familiar you are with this. You know, from your history, uh, you know, don't, na don't Native Hawaiians have access to private land under the Native Hawaiian, or the State of Hawaii Constitution? Is, are there rights of access? Is there a concern that if we get too into enforcement, people aren't going to be accessing lands that they need to access culturally, spiritually? Well, I think any responsible landowner would look at the law and make sure that they're following the rules. And yes, I think it's PASH is the, is the, is the state law mm -hmm. uh, allowing for access to sites. And I think any responsible landowner would make sure that those rules were being followed and allowed uh, cultural access. Well, you know, when you talk about this, there's so many different kinds of ownership. And like what you're describing, it's like there's no one to even turn Try, to. Trying to get everybody on the same page. <laughs> it, it's a big issue. I mean, and for, for these issues, a lot of it starts on city, right? They park on city property. They end up going on state property and probably traverse three or four other people's private <laughs> property. So, you know, trying to bring all these people to the table for a discussion is very, very hard yeah. to do. I mean, that's one of the things they talk about haiku stairs is that, you know, um, legal managed access. And you're right, I suppose if it were opened and charged a fee, it would probably be very profitable, I'm sure. But the problem is, is legal managed access. And as I mentioned earlier, it's landlocked. And depending on which route you ultimately went, uh, away from the neighborhoods, away from the community, that, so you're not in interfering with their quality of life, you could cross up to almost six different landowners. So you'd have to get permission and easements from all of those landowners. And most of them are state government. And of course, for us, the issue is always going to be liability. Liability. There it is again. <laughs> um, but I mean, do you, have you guys ever been tempted to sue somebody because <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, I imagine people have, but uh, in fact, the Monowili Estates Community Association has hired an attorney. They finally, for years and years, have tried to get the city and the state to come to the table and no one is, is doing it. And that's really sad that we have to contribute to an attorney to sue just so they'll listen to us, you know? But they did have, we actually do have an attorney, the Monowili Estates Community Association. Mm. Some more uh, qu viewer questions coming in. We've got about two minutes left. Um, in that social media is needed to balance bad information given on social media, what can be done to increase that effort? For example, volunteers. It's an interesting idea because you guys are working the trails. Could you encourage some people to go out on the safer trails and, and then just generate some social media to try and get some attention to the trails you want people to go on? Yeah, that is, that's a great question. And, 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 you know, going back to what Captain Jenkins was saying, you know, a lot of this is, is education. Yeah. So um, we are looking at ways of having uh, some kind of campaign to uh, target um, I don't know if target's the word for it, but to go to certain areas or certain locations on the internet where there is misinformation and um, try to correct it in some way or stop it in, in, in some other way. Um, we're looking at that and, and trying to come up with you know, different ideas and it might actually be pretty effective to do that with volunteers uh, so it doesn't uh, cost us that much and we know that some people are willing to help us with that. Uh, but there's, uh, it's, it's kind of challenging. Where is it? You have to keep up with that. Mm -hmm. and how you go about doing it and are there any legalities behind that um, and, and there might be some fees involved in terms of 
having membership to Yelp or Travelocity where some of this stuff is posted. I believe there's some, some things like that that we need to look into, but that's definitely um, definitely an option and, and we're looking into that. And call me because I can help you. We've actually started a rather oh, aggressive social media campaign and when we see tweets and stuff on the air, we're actually responding to them and then we're actually directing them to um, Aaron's uh, website for appropriate information on where to hike. Right. Um, another thing that uh, people are throwing out, where um, a method where people sign in, uh, is there, I mean, could you pass a law that just said, if you're caught on private property, uh, you don't have to go through the trespass process, you're going to be cited. Just, I mean, right, right now we don't have a law like that, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think it's just your criminal trespassing laws, and yeah. that's up to the, the landowner oh, to make sure that they're known that their presence is not allowed on this property. And that's and a lot of these areas are remote, so by the time you try to call 911 and get the police up there, Correct. generally they're gone. They're gone. Yeah. Okay, well, folks, we are done. Thank you so much, all of you, and mahalo to all of you viewers for being with us tonight. And our guests, Aaron Lowe Thank you. from the State of Hawaii Forestry Trail System, Kathleen Elliott Pahinui for the Honolulu Board of Water Supply, Captain David Jenkins of the Honolulu Fire Department, and Susan Dowsett, Kailua Neighborhood Board and a beleaguered member of the Manawili community. <laughs> <laughs> Next week on Insights, 50 years ago, under Chief Justice William S. Richardson, the Supreme Court of the State of Hawaii ruled the public had a right to access all beaches throughout our state, with a few ex exceptions carved out to accommodate the federal government. This remains true today, but for decades there have been challenges, clashes throughout the state involving access to these sites or public rights of way used to get to the beaches. What do you think? Is it time we found a way to settle these disputes that are directly associated with one of the most historically significant rulings in our history? Join the discussion next week right here. For Insights on PBS Hawaii, I'm Daryl Huff. Ahui ho.